It's the year 2021. COVID ravages the world. It's 2022, Scott. But two men still continue to blather on in their basements while no one's asking for it in the podcast known as... Trapped Under Plastic! The podcast for the acrylic paint-eating enthusiast. Was that your best James Hetfield experience? <laughs> is is my some kind of monster, okay, <laughs> except yeah, for yeah. Trapped Under Plastic. Okay, okay. I like it, I like uh, it. We're back, baby. We're back! And that intro was brought to us by somebody in the comment section of the YouTube videos. We grab our taglines that changes every episode from there. So if you have a new tagline for Trapped Under Plastic, put it down there in the comment section. Yeah, yeah. Describe the podcast in the most passive-aggressive way as you possibly can. So we're looking at you, Midwesterners. We don't take all of the intros, okay? We leave the crappy ones behind. Yeah, but we well, don't mention them because we're we're Minnesota nice. Oh, <laughs> whoops. <laughs> Uh, all right, John. We're back. The energy in the room is alive. Yeah. It's electric. <laughs> dinner, 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 dinner. <laughs> okay. So we're back in person. Let's get right into the preamble ramble. And uh, forgot I was going to shit on you for your terrible audio quality and video quality. Oh, my audio quality is good. Video quality is a freaking webcam. And I watched <laughs> the episode. I was like, God, I should have just hooked up with my own of my cameras. <laughs> Never again. Well, hopefully, you know, at some point, 40 years from now, we'll probably have to do another uh, virtual one. But never again are we going to have to worry about that. But yeah. yeah. My audio quality was bad, was it? Was it bad? Uh, I don't think it's as nice as these mics. No, I, I agree. I agree. It's not as nice as these. Yeah. Um, but it was, it was okay. Yeah, it was fine. It was fine. All right. Anyways, sprue shipping woes. Preamble uh, ramble? What's oh, going on here? Okay. Yeah. I uh I got a story to tell all the goody peepees out there. We love your stories, John. Yeah. Also everyone gather around children, children. Yeah, gather a seat by the fire. Papa John is telling <laughs> us a story. The glee man is here. Um the glee so, man. Yeah, that's a reference. We'll see if anyone gets it. Okay. So um I want to tell this story of about the sprues. So <laughs> we had to ship the sprues. To good Jonathan. Jonathan. No, yes. brother Jonathan. Brother, yes. Uh, who's making the amazing trapped under plastic sign because there's there's some engineering involved of how the sprues are, uh, will be integrated into the sign. Yes. And I had a giant collection of sprues that I've been keeping for a while that was for this purpose. And I decided I'm going to ship them because we need to get them out there. Uh, I've got a big old box and only about half the sprues that I had fit in the box. How many I had? It's a sad amount. It was like how many ever armies that I've painted over the last like year? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and so I take the box. Uh, I go to the um, UPS store and... And the line was out the door. They must have trouble with staff. So I'm like, I'm not going to do that. I'll come back another day. Come back another uh, the two days later. And the line was still out the door at like 10 a.m. So I'm like, I, wow. I call my wife. I'm like, where's another place I can go get this stuff shipped? She's like, well, go to the Hallmark store. Because they have a, they have, there's a post office thing where you can ship stuff in the Hallmark store. Okay. You don't know what a Hallmark store is. It is like... The place where old ladies go to buy shit they don't need. You know, <laughs> you want a seven dollar birthday card? That's where you go. You want to buy little bullshit ornaments for your Christmas tree and little knickknacks that go on your counters at home? That's yeah. where you go. You taught me a word to describe all of these things a long time ago. Remember yeah. the word? Chachkis. Chachkis. Yeah. It is the tchotchke mecca. Yeah, yeah. You are the reason for the increase in tchotchke usage in my life. <laughs> oh, I didn't, I didn't realize that. I feel a little bit better now. Uh, I haven't been into a Hallmark store since I was probably like 12 years old. My mom used to make me go into them when we go shopping together because my mom loves tchotchkes. <laughs> so, tchotchke enthusiast. Yeah. Um, and I went in, and when, as I go in there, I realize... I didn't, I didn't pack and take the top because when I go to UPS, they're real nice to me and I, they have packing tape there. I just tape it all up there so I don't have to spend money you're on the packing worst. tape. I'm the worst. You're the worst customer. Yeah, I am. Um, it's, so the box is open. <laughs> you're fucking around the fucking box of spruce. <laughs> and as I walk in there, I remember nobody that, that works at a Hallmark store is under the age of 70. <laughs> They're all old ladies that love tchotchke, so they got to get their fucking store discount, right? And I go in there, and a nice little old lady there, and on the side of the box, I reused a box that I had gotten something in the mail for something else. It says fragile. And and I put it up on the little the little uh, thing where you weigh it and shit. 
and I'm getting I'm asking her for packing tape. She looks at me funny. I'm like, don't she's like, God damn it. Yeah, so get out the packing tape, start pulling out some packing tape. She looks in the box and she says, Are these fragile? And I'm like, No. <laughs> she's like, But it says fragile in the box. I'm like, I'm just reusing the box. She's oh, okay. Um, well, are they made out of they give you the list of yeah, any yeah. of these kind of substances? Batteries. Food, yeah, right, right, whatever. right. And you can see the thing. It's just this plastic stuff all the way through. It's the like, box, do you but, see batteries in there, yeah. Karen? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so I can't like I can't let a moment pass me by. So I'm like, I'm never coming in this place again. So I say to her, she says, Is there you know, is there batteries? Are they alcohol? Are they dangerous liquids? And I'm like, uh, no, they're made of asbestos, but they should be fine. And then I go and I tape the top of the box. Are you serious? <laughs> and she looks at me like I'm an alien. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> and I'm like, how much does it cost? And she's like, uh, $22. I'm like, damn, that's a lot of asbestos. <laughs> she goes, are you serious? I'm like, no, it's not made of asbestos. And she's like, huh? Wow! <laughs> didn't she get wasn't a, having it. Didn't at even all. get a. Didn't even get a grin. I'm like, you're not a U- USPS employee, you know, Karen. You can you can take this joke, right? You know, <laughs> they yeah. can't at USPS. No, no, they can't take that joke there. <laughs> but uh, that was it. I paid my twenty two dollars of spruce shipping and I left, and that's my story. And you got no tips or or encores for more jokes. They had all sorts of a variety of old people candy right there at the yes. front registers. Werther's Originals. Well, like they were like, okay, we hear you like Werther's. Yeah, we're gonna rack it up three levels of yeah. these varieties of little sucky hard candies mm. of a variety of flavors. I almost bought a little tin of pina colada hard candies because <laughs> I was sitting there for so long while she tried to figure this stuff out and if I she needed to call the police because I'm shipping asbestos. <laughs> so she, she, She's like jamming the button under the counter. <laughs> yeah. It was like a shotgun yeah. in the back. Um, but I didn't buy any pina colada hard candies. Uh, if I ever have to go back in there, though, I know I'm going to buy some. Okay, yeah, in 20 years from now. I know. I don't you know. You're an old person that wants tchotchkes. Yeah, yeah, it's just true. Like, I think maybe that's a great name for a game store. Some play on the word, the Hallmark store, but it's not the Hallmark store, but it's tchotchkes for nerds. Okay, tchotchkes for nerds. Okay, pop quiz. How do you spell tchotchke? Uh, uh, I have it pulled up right here. It is not easy to spell. Uh, C-H-A-T-K-Z-E? <laughs> Uh, no, not even close. The Z is interesting. Yeah. It starts with a T. Wow. T C H O T C H K E. Tchotchke. Country of origin, please. Uh, country of origin. North American. That doesn't no, seem that, right. That's the definition. I don't know. It sounds Scandinavian. Yes. I guess. Wow. There's not even an A in there. I know. Ch- like the chach in the middle, C-H-O-C-H. It's the T. It's the T, dude. Otherwise, it's fairly uh, it's fairly easy to pronounce, but... Yes. Uh, also... Is that Urban Dictionary? <laughs> no, it's like Google. <laughs> uh, pro tip, why don't you just package and label it at your home? Because I'm lazy. Okay. Well, then you can skip the lines. I know. I could have skipped the whole line at UPS. Too. Yeah. It'd be like, hey, it's already done. Dude, I'm an old man. I don't like to do extra things that someone is getting a paid to job to do. A paid to job to do. A paid to job to do. Yeah. Like, I want to go to a place. You're the person getting paid to this. do this. You know more about this. I'm not going to screw this up because you're here to do it for I get me. that. I get that. You know? But how long does it drive to the UPS store? It was like seven minutes. Okay, so you did that twice. Yeah. 14 minutes. Yeah. Actually, it's there and back. Yeah. So 28 minutes. Yeah. I mean, I did it the second time I did it when I dropped my daughter off from school. So that really, okay, it was on okay, the way home. Okay. That wasn't as much. But then I had to go again over to the Hallmark store, which is another five minutes. And you had to wait there 20 minutes while Karen fucking figured out how to ship asbestos without yeah. getting arrested. Right. So you burned at least 30 minutes. I know, but I did get free packing tape. So <laughs> I think myself the winner. And then here's the other thing, old man. I, I have a little... <laughs> <laughs> you calling me old man? <laughs> no, another old man thing that uh, I did. Uh, okay, okay. The address of the person I'm mailing to, I have written out my hand on a sticky <laughs> note. <laughs> Better yet, you would have written it on the box in like pencil or something. Yeah, well, that's she gives me a Sharpie and I write it on there in Sharpie. And I'm like, this is... This is fucking Bush League. She gave you a Sharpie to write it on the box? Yes. Karen didn't print out a label for you? No. Okay. Uh, at, at UPS store, 
I give them the, st they like the sticky note. They're like, uh, what's the address is going to? I'm like, here you go. And they're like, oh, nice. Thanks. Yeah. Like th that's like high level for yeah, them. And, excited. and then they just, brrr, and they print it on, slap it on. I'm used to this. I'm not used to this government run bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, since I ship and fulfill the merch, or at least in Amber does that, we have like, you know, even we have a label printer. Mm. Um, so it prints out the you know, whatever the four by six size label, it's already has a, a backing on it. Sarah knows how to do that because she's got an Etsy store with her mom. Oh yeah, yeah. And yeah. she knows all this stuff. She's got the printer up at her work desk and shit, and she like prints all those what things. Why does she help you? Because that I, if I ask for help, I'm probably in trouble. So <laughs> it's like, oh, I need to do this for you, huh? I'm like, I'll pay you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want your money. <laughs> So yeah, I don't. Yeah. I'm too scared to ask her. No, I get that. I understand. <laughs> I understand. Uh, yeah, I know way more about shipping than I ever cared to know. Yeah. Uh, okay, my preamble ramble story. I have been painting a lot lately, mm -hmm. but only on one model. But I've usually I just paint in silence, like a fucking Tibetan monk or something. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I do that. <laughs> but I I have been listening to a lot of music, a lot of videos. I listened to like 60 songs off of the playlist. Like just start at the beginning, let it rip. Yeah. Y'all you like, you like some weird fucking music. <laughs> <laughs> there are some real, real good songs on there though. Um, that definitely could be pump up songs, which we haven't really picked one yet. That kind of just. No, we, we haven't had the, the official pump up song. I think. Let's think about this. That Are you going to have a sound system uh, in your studio? We can have one. That wasn't there wasn't a plan for it, but oh, I guess I got some fucking speakers, bro. <laughs> Are you offering them? I got these speakers, these clips, a clip speaker system. Mm -hmm. It's for the like seven point one. It's for it's for a st stereo for your whatever, but Home they're still theater. just solid. And you can we can put them on like on the walls and stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm not using them. I'm only using the center bar. And then I have like my big tower speakers. And then in our downstairs living room, it already had surround sound speakers in the room already wired into the walls. I'm like, I'm not taking this shit out. I'm just going to do that. So I got speakers. So I tell you that story to tell you this one. I think that we should get the sound system going. And then when we're in the new space, we'll find out what naturally happens. We'll like a, listen to a different one yeah, yeah, as yeah, we're yeah, setting yeah. up, as we're getting, we're getting ready. And then we'll, it'll come to us, okay. you know? And then, and then maybe we talk about it a little bit, like this is a song this is what we thought. Because a lot of people tell me if you got this experience and listening to the pump up uh, playlist, they, they heard pump up, but they didn't hear the rest of what I said. So I feel like y'all are only listening to about 50% of my words. I feel like they didn't even hear the pump up part. Yeah. Because <laughs> there was some fucking slow music in that playlist, bro. There's some wild stuff in there. <laughs> yeah. um, and we can we can put a... Can we put a link to the Spotify playlist? Absolutely. Okay, okay we'll do that in the video description. description. Um, and and there, there still is that thread on the Facebook group. I don't know if Jonathan is still going to add more, but I think people are still submitting songs on Dang, that thread. Dude. So maybe we can keep it growing, see how big we can get this thing. But I really want it to be feel good energy, right? Pump up. A lot of stuff on there was like, I, you know, I'm going to lift weights. You know, I'm going to squat however many pounds people squat and be like, Hoo! And, and there's some, there's some, you know, some like POD and some, other bands like that. <laughs> there that was some are, Pantera. Yeah, that's that a really good Pantera song. Yeah, uh, Cowboys from Hell is straight bangers, top to bottom. So <laughs> you got me there. Um, and there's, but like, I want a lot of those, like you know, the, like the Motown feel good, like oh, I'm feeling pretty happy. Yeah, yeah. And, and Boys are Back in Town is a great example. Boys are Back in Town, Low Rider. Yeah, like those are great ones. Yeah, so yeah. I'm from the seventies. Yeah, Steve, maybe. Steve, Steve Miller band stuff okay. is really great too. Yeah. Uh, Rush, just about anything from Rush. Rush yeah, um, would be great. But so yeah, I think we're, we'll we'll naturally find our place. But uh, so so you've been listening to it, yes. Uh, is that all you listen to when you were painting, or do you listen to other stuff too? No, I listen to the a lot of different stuff. I listen to a lot of Wolfpack, a lot of Alan Stone, a lot of uh, I've listened to Bo Burnham's the songs, the album, like a bazillion times. So I listen to a little bit of that, um, and I also listen to Dave Colwell. Uh, what? Dave, Dave's got a YouTube channel. Dave Seezy from Austria. Yeah, 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 yeah. Dave Seezy. Uh, he's got a YouTube channel where he uh, like just essentially holds up a finished model in front of a camera and ruminates about the experience. Yeah. Um, it isn't uh, like there isn't a lot of visuals, so mm -hmm. it's actually the perfect thing just to listen to. Right. If you're kind of into that, mm -hmm. Dave kind of just talks about 
very high level painting and like what he tried and how he thought it worked. It's like basically one of the sections in our extended podcast, but for one specific model and done on a YouTube video. Yeah. Um, I like, I, I listen to every one of those that he does. Oh, I nice. Feel okay. like I, I feel like I learned something. Um, but it's also like, it's not like crunchy learning. It's like this kind of, uh, th- uh, Stream of consciousness. That's yeah. the term I'm, I'm thinking of. Like stream of consciousness of his overall experience and how he went through these different things and tried and, and learned and felt like he could do better or, or <clears throat> things he wants to improve on, which is not so when you look at the things that he's showing and you're like, okay, Dave. Right, yeah. <laughs> and I mentioned that. I was like, you are super hard on yourself. And he was like, I, I think that's a positive thing because I can like not look at my models with you know rose-tinted glasses and see what's wrong and then try new things because of that, mm-hmm. which is absolutely true. Right. Um, but I think at the same time, I think we're both saying things that are right. Like People in this comment section are saying the model is amazing. It is amazing, but also there are things wrong that he sees that he wants to improve on. Yeah. Um, but yeah, those are good videos. Yeah. I think I think that, you know, if you, you know, if I were to grab Dave and throw him in the trunk of my car okay. and take him to an undisclosed location. Oh geez. And and chain him to a chair and say, Dave. Dave. Say something good about your model, Dave. <laughs> I could make him do it. Yeah, probably. Because I think you need a balance. I'm not saying I'm going to do that, Dave. Just get, Jeez, Dar- just get Daryl to do it. Yeah. Well, Daryl knows where to take him where no one can find him. Yeah. But um, <laughs> once, Daryl's, he, Daryl's your hitman once we get there, I would never hurt Dave. He's way too nice of a person. Yes. Um, I, I think that there's a level of like the, the excitement, the momentum, the feel goods of the piece that he has that he's not like focusing on because I think each of us – the the springboard to the next one to trying to improve to try to get better is on the also having a positive reaction of the result you got you're never going to be 100 percent satisfied but you also need to like absorb and and appreciate the good things too you're like that is still there's so many things about this that i did do well or it's better than last time and that's what you need to keep going if if you were to just focus on the things you did terribly it makes it that much harder to to kind of keep at it okay um, I think there's a, a balance there, and I'm I'm sure Dave has it. Um, it's also more interesting to to hear him talk about the things, the specific areas or the specific surfaces, the specific lighting that he doesn't think he nailed, because it allows me to look through it through a more kind of uh, critical lens. Yeah. Because when I look at his pieces, it's I I'm so like enthralled by them that it's hard for me to see that stuff. But I think each of us is that way on our own works right because yeah. we're so close to it and we've gone through the whole process of doing it and all the hours that it took that we're more critical or we think stand out to us more than like uh the 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 whole is greater than the sum of its parts whereas as the creator you you look at the, the individual parts more right. as the audience you look at the the masterfulness in in a whole yeah you see a picture with the angle that you painted to be the best angle mm-hmm. and then you kind of just you kind of get sucked into the the how awesome the whole thing is but yeah every part of a model that you paint is like done in sections and you kind of think about it in sections and how each part is better or worse but one idea he said in his video that was interesting was he started to paint the back of the model first so in his words or in his idea the the less undesirable the less fun part to paint um when I do the reverse, I, I, I paint the things that are more fun at the beginning and the worst stuff at the end. But you get this like, like the enjoyment sl- is like this, right? It starts out high and then goes to nothing. Whereas I believe if you did it how Dave does it, it probably would flatten out a little bit. Yeah. Because you have high energy in the beginning and you're painting stuff that's not fun, low energy at the end, but things that are fun. So I don't, do you have a, pre- what do you think? I kind of want to try out. What he's suggesting. Yeah, I, I, I think I kind of do too. I try to to start on the thing that's the most important. Yeah. The, the focus. Um, and oftentimes those are more intricate like faces and things like that, right? Mm-hmm. Things that are going to require um, skin, more blending and more schmoozing and futzing. But I also feel like it takes me a while to get in the groove of a paint job. And then I'm not actually painting my best at the beginning if I were to kind of look at it retrospectively. Yeah. And I'm not a hundred percent sure that's true, but I kind of, I feel like I get to a, where I catch my stride so long into a paint job, yeah. especially so long into a paint session, 
you know, if I like an hour in, I usually are like, I'm, you know, I'm like, I'm in it. I got my understanding of my paint consistencies down. Like right. Can, yeah, you, you have a, like yeah, a feel, yeah. an intangible yeah, yeah. feel of how things go. Yeah. And maybe starting right at the, you know, the head and the face and the skin is maybe not the place to, to do your best work. Yeah. Yeah. I totally get that. That's it. That's why. I, that's the only reason I don't paint as well as Dave. <laughs> I've not. I've not really thought about that. You know, I've not thought about like, okay, in this session, I want to paint the face, but I'm going to start painting something else: his hand, his arm, these bullshit straps, these fucking straps. <laughs> For, uh, I don't know, like maybe like 30 minutes to 45 minutes, and then I'll go on the face. Yeah. To like kind of warm up almost. Mm, the warm up uh, exercise. I like that. Stretches. Thing. All right. Pram ramble done. Let's talk about what we painted. What did you paint, Scotty, that you were listening to all these things? I will I talk about what I painted. I, I painted the Ranger, which is a 75 millimeter model from my upcoming Kickstarter. Uh, it's a wood elf. Um, and I'll show you the picture that I shared on the mailing list last week. Um, which was a work in progress picture. Um, it's done now. It took longer to paint than the Duchess. About 60 hours. Oh, 60, doggy. 50 hours, somewhere in there. Uh, part of it was the base, because the base is a lot more intricate than the Duchess's. And also, yeah. there's a second head to paint. That's true. Um, That's true. I didn't think about that. You've got the most like detailed, refined, sizable second head. And it's also like yeah. in the money shot of the model. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, everyone's got bonus heads. I didn't think about that. Um, but yeah, it took a while to paint. It probably took a long time to paint also because I was kind of dragging my feet on it a little bit. Um, when you when you put the pressure on of a digital course, you, you kind of do all sort, sorts of weird things. You're like, I need to do something new and exciting. I need to like you know, really think about this process. And, and I kind of just said, you know, to hell with all that. I'm going to paint this model, how I paint every single model and just like think about it more mm -hmm. um, so that I can better illustrate it to an audience. So my course is going to be about how to come up with a paint scheme on the fly, which is how I paint. Um, and so I've, so I've been really thinking about exactly what's going on in my head while I'm painting. And I have like a list of uh, like notes that I took about what I'm thinking at each stage about specifically the color scheme and how I am picking each color for each section. It's kind of like you have like this scale, right? At least in my head. And, and, and on this model, I'm working with greens and, and warm tones. And like whenever I paint a part, the scale kind of tips in one area. And so then I have to kind of bring it back by painting a different part, a different hue or different warmth. And then I kind of keep this balance going while I'm painting. Um, so yeah, I painted that model, took a hell of a long time and it's done. Thank God. It's, that's a really timely and interesting, uh, explanation on how you're approaching the course because just this week I wrote up, um, the section of my course yeah. on my, uh, process that is, is going to have a different approach than the one you described. Yeah. Not that, and not that one or the other is better or worse. Right, yeah, yeah. Just a different way that I go about it. So I, I'm excited that from the get-go, ours are going to to be different. Different, yeah. And yeah. it's even different than the Duchess. The one with the Duchess, I went crazy with the prep work. I like took pictures of the model, colored it in Photoshop, went out and bought like materials of the like the materials that I wanted to represent in real life on the model. Um and this is one is is very different, um, mm -hmm. but I like having you as an instructor, Ben as an instructor, because each course is just hopefully going to be really different about the approach to the model at the very least. Yeah, uh, I, th I think so, and I think it's it's you you get a wide variety not only because each of them is on a different model, but it's uh, you get to see and maybe if if for anyone that wanted to take more than one of the courses to pick and choose the things that resonated with you or really stuck out with you and kind of define your own process and how you, you could do things. Yeah. Um, and then I started to paint this silenced man. Uh, this is a unit from my great joy army. He's a unit. Didn't finish it though. Oh no. Did, uh, uh, what I painted. Um, I'm trying to remember from the last episode. You painted a Tau dark strider. I painted uh, the new, is that what his name is? Dark strider. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds like a sweet superhero name. <laughs> Dark Strider. Yeah. It's like evil Aragorn. <laughs> He's one of them there, Dark Striders. <laughs> He's one of them ranger folk. <laughs> um, new model, a Games Workshop. He's a Tau. And uh, I, I 
I went a pretty sizable amount of ball sack into this. Oh. Um, and how I much, took how much? two straight days, probably two straight <laughs> eight-hour days. I thought you were going to say two straight balls. Yeah. <laughs> 100%, dude. Just dipping them in the, <laughs> dipping them in the drink. <laughs> but I didn't leave them submerged, right? You, you, you give them a good dousing yeah but you don't allow you, you don't, don't want to be soggy yeah you don't need any soggy bottoms you know um <laughs> but i keep them in there until the bubbles stop coming out right you don't want you don't want to come out looking like a couple of wrinkled raisins you know <laughs> where they get all shriveled uh, Wait, what do yours look like <laughs> just fucking plastine <laughs> and shiny and smooth they look like truck nuts fucking taut <laughs> <laughs> glistening <laughs> Uh, okay. Anyway, <laughs> talk about um, Oreos and dipping Oreos in milk right now. Okay? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You, you, you got you can't let them you can't let them dunk so long that when you pull it back up, it like kaploosh, they yeah. fall off. Yeah, yeah, that's the worst. thing you got this fucking lump of Oreo gush at the bottom of your cup, yeah, and you're like, well, do I dig it out? Do I go upstairs and get a spoon to dig it out? Do I dig it out with my dirty fingers? Do I leave it in there? There's so many decisions. In I that go with moment. the fingers. Just, just fucking the hand just goes. Oh my god! <laughs> Remind me never to accidentally drink out of your milk cup. You sick son of a bitch! <laughs> like you'd ever fucking do that? I don't know. There, I, Yo, you, know. you got some milk right there. <laughs> hey, bro, you want to share a little bit of that milk? It looks looks like there's a little bit of little bit of chunkage floating in there. That looks right up my alley. <laughs> it's fucking like I don't even know what be on my hands. Like fucking paint particles in the fucking milk. <laughs> Cheeto dust. <laughs> Well, so that's what I painted. <laughs> yeah. I was like, what are we even talking about right now? Um, so I tried to paint this like heavy metal style, like Darren Latham style, like um, just going through the experience because it's so different than how I usually paint. And uh, it was such a learning process. And what I, the big thing that I took away from it, and we'll talk more about some real and a real specific thing that I think was really interesting to me in the uh, preamble or not the preamble, the after party where I talk about something new I tried, but it's, it's a process to paint this way. That is, it's very attention to detail focused. Um, I feel like there's no part of this process that you can kind of just like take it easy on because everything builds off of what's below it for a very refined and crisp final process. Yes. Um, and and yeah. I think the more you hold yourself to that from the very beginning, the better your final product is. Yeah, yeah. And, and it even comes down to like painting in the lines. Yeah. It's like your first layer of paint, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So. Everything is in the lines and, you know, and going back and, and redefining that that black lining and stuff like yeah. that. And I, I'm not 100% done as of the recording of this podcast of this piece. And I'm, I'm almost there. And I got to do the base and it's Stupid base. He's like standing next to like a ruined wall. Yeah. But the wall was like almost as tall as him and it take like covers the whole back of the model. Did you make it smaller? Um I I primed it without gluing that piece on because it's a separate part of the base. Mm -hmm. So I could get all the way around the model. But I, I did have that conversation with myself of do I like re-sculpt this smaller? Um, I think I'm gonna keep it as is because it that you can still see most of the important parts of the model, but if it was for like a, a competition or or something like that, I probably would re-sculpt that wall or like hack it in half and then fit it right so it still looks like GW sculpt. But um, but the weird thing about this is it was a very fulfilling process. Like it was in I said that like you have to have a, a strong attention to detail from the whole process this way, but it's also kind of mindless work. It's very craftsman. It's not very artistic. And I don't mean that in a slight in the paint style. I mean that I could mentally check out one part of my brain that was the decision-making part. But I had to be very focused on the technical aspect of my hand doing exactly what I needed it to do. Yeah. My paint acting exactly how I needed it to act. If those things were wrong, it I'd make mistakes. Hmm. And I did make mistakes. I'm not an expert in this paint style. But at the end of the day, the how the mini turned out, I'm pretty proud of. Like it looks it looks pretty cool. It looks like um, you know, in a heavy metal, heavy metal, heavy, no H. Sorry, guys. Uh style. So nice. I enjoyed it. And I feel like having gone through that, I'm better at certain aspects of painting. And I realized that I have been kind of lazy in certain aspects of my painting. And uh 
uh, I, nothing's holding me back now. It's kind of crazy. Whenever I paint that way, a bit of my soul is taken away. Mm, yeah. And so it's interesting to hear that's that fulfilling to you. But like the way they paint, like every part of the model is treated specially. Mm -hmm. It's like there's nothing you can really phone in, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's just like, it's kind of like, man, it's it's kind of rough. And then with GW figures, they have all kinds of fucking sci-fi tchotchkes on there. Yeah. And so it's just like, it kind of sometimes gets a little burdensome to paint like that. Um, but it's good to hear you, uh, you were fulfilled by it. Are you yeah. going to do it more in the future? I think so. And okay. I think actually one thing I took away from it is that this was actually a really good exercise for me to do to then go back to my Golden Demon piece. Oh, so yeah. I feel like I actually got some momentum, some things that I learned and I'm, I'm going to really adhere to as I get to working back on that. Okay. Um, even the work that I've done thus far, I feel like, man, if I would have been doing it this way from the beginning, even though I'm not painting it in that style or that that you know, approach, that could have been more refined. And the good thing is, if you want to spend more time, you can... You know, you know, you can add more depth and more evolution and, and more detail and, and refine things that way. So it's not like the work was for naught, but sure, yeah, okay. But yeah, that's it. That's what I did. Nice. I painted a robot man with a weird. I just thought their freaking heads are freaking weird. Robot. Looking. They're just aliens. They're just they, like they don't have a nose. They got a big slit between their eyes. Yeah, they're Voldemort. Is that a nose? Is that like a, a single long floppy nostril? I don't know. Is I would assume like so. <laughs> Just, I want to see. I want to see like a video just where it opens shows and there's teeth inside of it. <laughs> <laughs> I want to he, like if they like run like a towel runs a long ways and then he stops and he's like catching his breath. I want to see that little slit going, <laughs> 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 going open and close. Yeah, absolutely. Um, That's what happens. That's exactly it. All right, on to the topic for today, John. You picked it out. What is this from Nick? Essek or Essek. Essek. Yeah, he even put the, the enunciation, how to pronounce his last name in parentheses. How oh, nice. nice of Nick to do that. Thank you, Nicholas. Nicholas Essek. So Nick had a great topic idea. And when we were shooting around ideas, and it, this totally wasn't last night at the 11th hour, um, <laughs> this one jumped out to me. And Scott is currently in the document formatting it yeah well you have a extra dot per dot yeah i know because it gives us a nice visual breakup to keep them separated scotty you know what also gives me a nice visual breakup the fucking first dot that's already there <laughs> you fucking, what are you doing do you do this is this how you operate? No, i just copy pasted it and that's how it came in so i, I uh, hate uh, it uh <laughs> <laughs> where's james 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 fix the formatting uh, all right, so the name of the actual topic is, what does your dream miniatures-based game look like? And specifically, from the angle that gets you excite excited to paint for that game, too. Ooh! Okay. So we're about to drop some bombs. We're This is Nostradamus style. This is going to be the game that we're all going to be playing and loving and attending tournaments for and collecting and painting and building and 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 what's and, it, uh, and kit bashing yes customizing in five years yeah if you want if you want to steal ideas from a podcast this is the one yeah all right but kickstarter makers fucking get your notepads out yeah because no, we're kidding. about to break down the best miniature game that could <laughs> ever live and having never designed one ever and no 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 we're so, not worried about rules very expert here rules Okay, yeah, you have a lot of extra info in here. What the, are, these what are all this? these are all things that that like Nick bonus, put in bonus questions. Yeah, from like Mr. Essek. I think he gave is, the point of it was to give like some structure, some direction. We don't necessarily have to follow all these, but I wanted to include them if, in case they got us thinking about different areas. Of sure, it. yeah. Okay, so let's talk about the first and most important one, and that is lore. <laughs> Does it exist or not? Uh, the the whole like I I see this as a big giant fat rule book. In the first page, it says the history of the world, and it just says fuck lore. <laughs> it's one sentence. Okay, here's my thing with lore. I feel like when it gets to be really good, it's really good. But until that point, it's fucking useless. Mm -hmm. Like Guild Ball had lore. I didn't give a shit about that. Yeah, you need to be able. It you need an elevator speech, right? We got three floors. We walk in. I walk into an elevator in my businessy suit. You're standing there with this, you know, you're going up to the shark tank to, to, to pitch your idea. And you got this big box of miniatures and, and books and dice and shit. And I'm like, hey, what you got there? 
You got three floors to explain to me what the, the what the game is. Um, oh, the elevator. Pitch. Okay, yeah, yeah sure. the elevator pitch of what is it that the the story of the game that is interesting. And Guild Ball does that. Like, there's all these different guilds in a fantasy setting that they get together on the weekends, they drink beer, and they play killer soccer i don't even think that's the story but uh, that's what i think it is <laughs> well that's yeah okay yeah you need something that like justifies what's going on that's like a paragraph yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely yeah like uh vincey v and uh uncle adam theirs was good for rain and hell it was the the fate of humanity is in the balance all these different factions in hell are vying for control they all have their nefarious things that they want done right yeah but I cool. feel like when a lore is really good, I know you don't agree with this, it really transforms how much I enjoy the game. Mm. But I, don't, I often don't want to get into the lore of the games that I play. But like for Warhammer, it kind of just happened that way, and it makes me love the universe. It's honestly probably the main reason why I would play Age of Sigmar, because I'm so invested in what goes on in the sure. world, and the models are cool. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I, do you want to talk about lore though, for real? No, 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 okay, no, okay, no, no. Okay. I think that's something in in my hierarchy of needs for a game that that will exist. But it's like the the food pyramid, the 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 sugars at the top, right? It's like it's good that it's there. It makes us get this nice, pretty little pyramid shape. But if I don't have a strong structural foundation, that doesn't matter. Right. That will not sell product. That will not get people to play my game. Right. That could be like, oh, that's a cool thing. I want to learn more about that. But again, that's the two cents version. If it's got depth later, great. But I think the foundation of what makes a miniature game awesome, what what draws me to it, is, is not necessarily that. Because quite frankly, if a game is the best miniature-based game out there, it could have the most terrible lore and it wouldn't make me not want to play it mm. but there are plenty of people that would think much differently okay i think the game needs to be awesome and all those other things are just sprinkles okay so that's just all me right. personally i know that other people are different and right. don't worry our game will have awesome lore <laughs> the bestest of lore and i totally John's gonna write it yeah i'm totally not gonna just it just be like a giant fucking trolling of lore of everybody else's that's totally not what it's gonna be if we work on a game together he is coming nowhere near the lore department okay i will ban all johns yeah. there'll be me there'll be like meetings of the minds everyone sitting around the table and i'll like walk in with like a, a twinkie in my mouth and be like hey what are you guys what are you guys doing <laughs> like Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> You're just like fucking putting the papers away. Yeah. <laughs> putting them in the briefcase. Okay, anyways. Let's talk about the fucking game. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to spend more time talking about fucking lore than anything else. Okay, so do you want to like approach this from like, what's the scale? What's the playing length? Like, do you want to talk about like each aspect? Or do you want to talk about like a game start to finish that you like the idea that doesn't exist yet? Uh, I want to talk about the game that doesn't exist yet. Okay. You want to go first, or you want me to go first? Uh, yeah, well, we can break it down in little sections. Okay, little sections. So, you want so first, let's talk about the the setting. Okay, fantasy, yeah. fantasy. Okay, that's we're, it. We're, Next, we're, we're, <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't, I don't think sci-fi is particularly bad. I just like sci-fi more. I like fantasy more. Okay, um, I, I I completely agree with you. I, I'm all about the battles of orcs and men, swords and shit, swords and sorcery. Yes, Conan. Yes, Willow. Monty Python, <laughs> Bill and Ted's. At, no, that's um, okay. I, I I think that the the fantasy setting to me personally is so much more exciting. Yeah, I think that it the the aesthetic of it is so much cooler. The it's got so much nostalgia factor for many of us, you know, us included. And and we grew up on that that kind of just enthralling nature of the Lord of the Rings and oh. and all the the, the great. Um, 80s and 90s movies and the, the Conan cartoon. Who out there ever watched the Conan cartoon? That, car that cartoon was amazing. Not I. Oh, man. I guess Just a lot of movies. Time. Watched Willow. Watched Never Earning Story. Mm, Legend? You ever see Legend? Legend, dude. Fucking uh, crazy. I watched it again recently. Oh, he's crazy. Yeah, it's harsh, man. I love it. Yeah, dude. Fucking oh, Satan's in it. <laughs> yeah. That, that, that's a, a badass, like... Tim what, Curry, dude. Yeah. The, um, the, the suit... What do they what do they call it? Uh, the prosthetic? Uh, they call it something effects. Bodies. Real effects. It's oh, not real effects. Practical effects. Practical effects. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The practical effects in that movie. Primo. Do you know how long it took Tim Curry to get into that outfit, dude? I don't know. Eight 
hours Whoa. every single time it's like we need to shoot all these damn scenes today <laughs> yeah yeah you gotta get in here at 6 a.m so we can shoot at two it's Man. like it's fucking crazy it, i wonder how long it took to get out if you just like oh. pulled it off like, <laughs> you just fucking zip a thing and it just, it just peels off you Ugh. all right anyways fantasy okay yeah yeah okay. now now there's another reason why i think fantasy oh because we're, we're gonna there's there's toes that are gonna be dipped in to other aspects of game design in each decision we okay. make because okay, okay. we are serious people okay <laughs> industry leaders that they don't even know exist <laughs> okay here's the other reason from a game design standpoint from a play at the table standpoint setting your game in a world where people have fucking laser guns in a world limits your design space so much why is my dude have a cool axe and a sword? Well, that guy can melt me from across the the football field. How did Dune answer this question, John? Riding worms. No. Because they have shields that you can't penetrate with guns until you get up close and personal and fucking stab them in the neck. Yeah, you like slow stab, though. Slow stab. It's, yeah. it's not like you can stab, stab. You'd no, be like, like ah, I'm just going to slowly do stab. That. Like Saving Private Ryan style. Remember yeah. that scene? I don't. Oh, uh, but I've seen in, that movie. in the bell tower? Dude, okay. That was one of those movies that my dad had me watch with him, and he was like, this is a mistake, but I'm not going to stop. <laughs> we can't stop now. <laughs> so I was like, probably 12 10 when i watched it oh we've landed on normandy we all, can't go home now all i remember is fucking tom hanks shooting a goddamn tank with a handgun and then it stops and he's like it worked <laughs> that's all i remember oh man there's a scene god this just makes me cringe every time i think about it, it like it's ingrained in my psyche i'm sorry for the goody peepees that are going through this mentally with me right now where he's up in a bell tower and he's a sniper Oh, the, it's an enemy sniper. No, it's, it's a, an allied sniper. Oh. And he's doing a great job. Ping, 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 ping. Just picking him off. But uh, Nazi guy like sneaks up there and gets there. And they have like this skirmish hand to hand. And it ends with the, it ends with the Dune killing. He's got a knife. The, the, I believe, oh yeah, the <laughs> Nazi guy has a knife and they're fighting over the knife and they're like crawling and they're on top of each other. And he's like laying, laying on him and it's, slowly pushes into him and yeah. he's like ah yeah it's and then at some point you realize you're just two normal guys fighting for someone else's ideologies yeah. and it's just like fucking a man yeah uh anyways why is why are we talking about this it's just it, it, it makes things it makes the game system really you put a lot of restrictions on yourself in the game from making the rule system to make it balanced sure okay in, yeah yeah in a in a fantasy setting you you have a lot more control over one, the kind of primitive nature of ranged combat and the limitations around magic. You can build systems around those. If it's simply that everyone can shoot everyone, not only is your game less dynamic from a movement and territorial, you know, the action going on because you're just kind of like, all right, my guys take another step to the right and then they shoot and then they take another step to the right and then they shoot and over three turns your guys have moved an inch and a half okay and it just now you and then you have to basically build your own system around ways that deal with the structure and the the, the kind of fencing in that you've built yourself into in the first place if we have guns and bolter rifles and laser shooters and giant cannons and shit suddenly we have to like make up this whole complex rules to balance that. And that's why I think, in my opinion, Age of Sigmar is a better, more balanced, interesting game than Warhammer 40,000 because it doesn't have to work around all the weirdness to make any kind of melee combat work. Part of the, they, they're constantly like, that's a, that's a balanced thing that Games Workshop constantly has to deal with. And they have to deal with it in Age of Sigmar too, because there's this balance of ranged and melee and all the kinds of things. But if your system is a sci-fi system, it's got to have freaking sweet ass guns and shit. Dude. You do it like the freaking Star Wars, where it's like, well, if you got a lightsaber, you can just ding, 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 deflect fucking everything and move at a thousand miles an hour. That's you the only way. Realize? That's the only reason lightsabers work. You know, Rich realize, John. Hmm. The reason John likes fantasy settings is for lore reasons. Balance is, in, balance is in the reason. You can balance any game to work with any kind of setting you want. Yeah. You think it's better in a fantasy setting because it's more justified. Yeah. Because it existed in, in swords 
and arrows existed at the same time because that's that was what was used right yeah. it made sense yeah. they were they were equal you could prefer to be an archer you could prefer to be a swordsman but either way you might have a similar impact right yeah in the in the future in sci-fi we gotta have imagine things right yeah you gotta you gotta justify and you you have, you have a hard time justifying why you would use a chainsaw when you can use a fucking blaster yeah. or a splinter rifle you know, it's it, a fucking lore reason. It goes back to but it, it's not to do with balance. It's a lore. It's a lore reason, but it's a, like a lore is bullshit reason. <laughs> because like explaining the thing with Dune is exactly that. And it's like if, if I'm at a game store and I walk in, I see some guys playing some sweet ass game to be to be released in 2027, and and they're like, oh man, that game looks awesome. They're like, oh man, you guys got these giant shoulder cannons. That guy's got hand axes. How do you not just like just shoot him off the table? And you're like, well, actually, in the lore of this game. They have these shields. You can't see it on the miniatures, but because of that, I'm like, fuck this. I'm out. <laughs> fuck your game. I don't care. This is stupid. <laughs> I think that's a you problem, dude. <laughs> okay. Anyways, we like fantasy. Fantasy. Next question. Uh, skirmish? Full scale? Something different? Mm. I. Uh, How many minis in your army? Oh, okay. Miniature size. I, Miniature I like size. between five and 15. So, so skirmish game. Yeah, yeah. I, okay. I, I want my war band. I want each dude to be unique. Yes. I want each lady to uh, be like, this is exactly who this is. I yes. want everyone to have, you know, who they are and what they're good at and what makes them unique. Yes. I like that. Big games are cool and they're fun. But again, not just, I'm, not, I'm thinking beyond just the at the table experience. I'm also thinking about people going to play this game. How many people actually play games of 40K and Age of Sigmar because of the sheer amount of models and the sheer amount of time it takes because there's so much shit in it? We don't get to play as much. As opposed to a game like Magic the Gathering, so I got my deck, you got your deck, we sit down, we can play a dozen games in an hour. Well, compare, don't compare it to Magic the Gathering. Compare it to Underworlds. Compare it to anything else. I'm thinking about Magic the Gathering. I'm thinking about Dota. I'm thinking about well, that's, Battlefield. Yeah, but you I'm can't compare them because it's way easier to play Dota than it is to play fucking 40K. I know, but what if we could bridge that gap? I know. Okay, that is the thing I want to talk about. Bridging the gap between video games and miniature war games. Oh, yeah. There I are got many, fucking ideas There now. are many things in video games that I would love in a miniature war game. But my idea for a game is one model. So we'll go on from there. One? One model. One's all you need. One's all you need. Uh, it, makes, it makes balancing more difficult. It does. Well, it makes a lot of things interesting and different. But anyways, okay, so model count, I agree. Skirmish games are amazing. I love that. It makes them easier to paint. Um, easier barrier of entry. You get yes. more people trying it out. More people are the, you know, you, it's not that hard to put together what's in a box and right. just play. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Scale of the model. How big are the minis? I like them little minis, man. I like them little minis, man. I like them little minis. What is that? That tickled me the right way. Yeah, I like I like painting bigger minis for a display or to like put on your wall with tchotchkes and shit. But I, when I'm playing, like I just want them little thirty twos. <laughs> them little thirty twos. Uh, I think for the idea that I'm thinking about, I want it to be a seventy five mil model. Wow! Wow! That just happened. You did. Okay. What's Why? Next? Why? What's well, okay. All right, here's my elevator pitch. And I, I feel like we've already discussed this. Yeah, you we kinda, have. You kind of you kind of know what's coming. I know what's coming. Mordhau slash For Honor, but in a miniature war game. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if you don't know those video games, they are first person or third person, but you're controlling one character in medieval combat. And the controls are very complex. They, uh, they are very drilled down. So... Even how you hold the sword, uh, how you how you repost and how you block and how you dodge and how you roll, all of these individual controls are you can use when fighting in one on one combat. So it's like, what does that look like in a miniature war game, where the list building instead of I want a unit of ten dudes, a unit of five dudes, a unit of three dudes, the list building is I have one man, and I need to give him a left gauntlet, and that costs seven points. I need to give him a whatever a flap for his butt cheek that costs this so this building is how am i kidding out this single warrior for this one-on-one -on -one combat yeah um uh that was something that was a, a big underlined point of my my wants as well is the customization yes within list building the, yeah the list building is not so much for me it's it's more than you but there is some list building in which different dudes i bring in my game in yours it is the innate 
things that each of the different heroes have yeah that makes them unique okay. that other people can't get okay and then the list building is down to gear it's down to magical effects yes it's down to special abilities okay there's one thing about fantasy that i know you didn't play that i really fucking loved um and that was that each lord could have 100 points of items each, yes each hero could have 50 points oh, and baby. there were five five or four categories there were arcane items there were banners there were uh, uh, there's armor, weapons, and then a fifth one I can't remember. But you could like look through like these three or four pages of like all wood elf items or all vampire items, mm -hmm. and you could like okay, what's the best combination of things here to make my lord fucking kick ass? Mm -hmm. And it was so fucking sick. I love doing that, and that doesn't exist in Age Sigmar anymore. So that's kind of like my version in like the single uh, model way. Mm. And from like a balance, I say I'm going to keep going back to this balance thing. I just spent too much time with Vinci V. Um, <laughs> Because his his brain works at another gear in terms of of game design and the from a, a balance perspective because I think you always need to keep balance in mind at least in my mind because if the game feels balanced it feels like people are more apt to have a two way positive experience absolutely win yeah. or loss that the game is fun and exciting and engaging and the it. it if you're not fighting against the game system in order to have fun. And so for this, you feel like, well, my army's just not good anymore, or it had, doesn't have the newest updates, or it's not the new hotness anymore. And yes. so my 2,000 points of Fire Slayers is just shit, and there's nothing I can do about that. Now, I can still have fun with them. I could still win games with them, but there's this... It's like these external forces are letting you know you're it's they're in a bad place. Yeah. But in this, if you I have this stop guy, that from happening though, right? You you can build a system that minimizes that greatly. And your system does that um in in, in mine, which is slightly better, but it's <laughs> uh it's, it's a different game. But uh they're they seem so far to be very very similar games are they yes so far um that because you have so much customization that isn't requiring buying another 700 dollars worth of models that you can respond to in how you kit your dude out with his gear or his artifact or his sword to deal with a thing that is powerful in the game or this guy's got this really strong ability and people use him and he wins a lot well i can work that meta into how I bring my guy and kit him out because I've got more options. And the options aren't just the 15 different kinds of units in the army. It's the intricate decision-making I do to have his shield be an anti-magic shield because that dude will shoot fireballs across the room at me, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Like, and, and I'm giving up some things. Maybe I'm not as good at doing damage because I'm, I'm the, the pros and cons of all these decisions that I make. But because... Your base characters, they're they're fairly similar across the board with, with they're just their unique aspects. And then it's just what they have access to in unique decision making means that those decisions are made and changed um, and how you want to play. And you can play this guy, this paladin guy, um, one game have a separate total loadout of, of how you have them kitted out on your sweet little app. And you just go to the, the you swipe next. It's like, OK, this is my more mealy dual handed axe build for the paladin and he plays totally different but it's still the same model it's still the same game i know his rules it's just the tweaks of different things and so i i think being able to have more of the customization in the points not in the models but in the decisions you make and how you um make them unique is cool yeah you know how gilbo has a drafting step in mm -hmm. the game i actually kind of like that and it's kind of, you kind of, you, something you said made me realize that it would be a good idea to have that in a game too, where, um, I like how you can retrofit your experience based on who you're playing. Like there are lists that are like all comers, but like if you want a real competitive experience, having two lists that are designed to fucking kill each other is like really fun. And so in Guild Ball, you do that with drafting. You have like a list of, uh, a 10 man list and you pick six dudes from it. And this, you more, alternate. Exactly. And this thing you could list build right before the match so it could be like a 15 minute thing i'm gonna list build I, i'm playing a paladin i'm fighting against a, 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 a wizard mm -hmm. and i know i need these various things 
Because it's difficult to like go to a tournament, for instance, and play against five different opponents who are wildly different and have like you know two generic lists that you can use. Mm -hmm. So if there was if there was a drafting component built into the cycle of the gameplay, um, like right before you play, I think that'd be cool. And if it was like not too heavyweight, that'd probably be preferable. Um, it gets me thinking that Dota does this in oh, two yeah. in two different ways. Oh, actually, yeah. Oh, yeah. A, a very obvious one, and then one that is less obvious but equally as important. Yeah. The first one is that actual the the where you go back and you you can uh, deny somebody that they can't the on the other team they can't pick that character. Yeah. And then you pick one. Yeah. And then the other team sees who you picked, and so you make decisions for your team make a big on that. Yeah. But what's equally is interesting in a game like that is that a, that same kind of decision making happens throughout the game in which items items you build for yep. based on who you're going against yep bkb could be awesome in some matchups and it's not worth the investment in other matchups right yep. right black king bar yeah <laughs> and so that's cancel out your stupid ccs bam is that what that does uh yeah it makes you immune to magic yeah. So easily. physical things still affect you. Yeah. Right before you enter and you know she's just going to freeze me, but psh, it's up. You can't freeze me now, bitch. Yeah. <laughs> You're dead. Uh, yeah. I mean, that even goes so far as certain heroes count, counter other heroes at various phases in the game. And it changes. Certain heroes are better against ones in the beginning, but not so good in the middle. It's, mm -hmm. it's very... So yeah, that, that, that's pretty interesting as well. Oh, yeah. Okay. Anyway, so we discussed uh, list building. Yes. Um, that's important. Um gameplay length uh what do you want this game to take do you want to be okay i want my friends to come over for four hours we're gonna get some snacks out and have an experience do you want it to be 30 minutes to an hour what are you thinking yeah i don't want a three plus hour game because okay. if a game is meant to be played in three hours and it's just go to warhammer okay those are meant to be played in three hours that means that people that are really 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 good at the game like they know all the rules and your rules in and out, and they can do everything super fast. They can play a game that goes to full five rounds, maybe two and a half hours. Maybe I'm saying no one gets tabled here. I'm saying everyone takes each other five turns, maybe two and a half hours. But the vast majority of people that play the game are not those people. Yeah. And the game drags on to three and a half, four hours sometimes. And it it like the actual process of the game kind of becomes draining because it takes so long. Yeah. And especially if the game's not going yeah. well for you, like it's just like, let's, let's just prolong my agony here. <laughs> and, and you just end up with a bad taste in your mouth. So from, again, from a game design standpoint, I don't want the bad taste to linger long. I want you to get excited to go to the next one. Okay. So how long does the game in your world take? 45 minutes give or take that's fast yeah okay. yep it should because it should feel like action and if a game feels like action and excitement and big things are happening all the time then it should move fast and a game design should be elegant enough to where there's strong decision making points where you feel like skill is involved in the game and planning is involved in the game but as they play out they're not the decision points don't take a lot of real time. It's like, okay, now you did that. Now I do this. I got to roll these dice. Okay. Versus your blah, blah, blah. And I got to roll another set of dice and blah, blah, blah. So every like sub, you know, engagement is drawn out to six steps yeah. to determine a result. Okay. It, it, it's just very long. Um, also by the sheer fact of mine is a, a smaller, a war band style game. Those games tend to go quicker. You have yeah, less. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah things right and yours being a one-on-one -on -one, which could be a ton of decision points a lot of abilities and options you have at any given time right but it's it's a single thing right 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 so yeah i think roughly 45 minutes okay if it could be 30 i think that might even be better but it might be too quick and too simplistic of a game that so yeah there are several things pinging around in my head about length and you definitely just hit one right there is i would love it if it were short but i think i want best of both worlds here I would love it if it were short, but also that you would play it in a best of three or a best yes. of five. So it's like, you know, it's interesting because like things change over the course of playing a game multiple times. I learned this in Hate. Hate has a setup where when you play a game, it's actually two battles, but they do that because of a critical error they made in balance mm. um, because the 
there's always one player that's going first every single round. And so you need to sw- swap it over to the other player going first every single round in a different game. Okay. Uh, but if there were a best of three and you could draft in between each round based on what you learned in the previous matches and each game took 45 minutes, you could have that longer experience if you wanted to, or you could just play one battle um, and it'd be short. So I think having both of those as an option wouldn't be too bad. Yeah, I think so too. I think the the going first thing is a, that's that's a a point that needs to be thought up earlier rather than later in a game design process because it yeah. can it can straight up affect games that are otherwise really well done games so dramatically yeah that can you can just suck the fun out of things yeah um, magic go back to magic magic's evolved the way that they've dealt with it over the years obviously it's in any tournament structure it's a best of three setting yeah the person that lost the first game gets to choose going first or second but they also have it built in where the person that goes second draws a card on their first turn. The yeah. that goes first is not. So yeah, there's yeah, a resource yeah. allocation in that as well. That's nice, yeah. Um, and the style of deck, the style of play style of whatever that you're doing will affect that. Yeah. In most games, um, it, you know, it, you don't want it to be where it's a non-decision. Okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, and um, Guild Ball has that similar mechanic where if you go second, you get one MP. So yeah, some kind of thing for that first turn. Resource. It's all about these resources. Yes, resources. resources. Yeah, so you're thinking roughly that... 45 minutes would be nice, because if we wanted to play a best of three, that's like two hours and 15 minutes. That's kind of like a longer experience. Right. Yeah. And the one thing that we talk about time, too, is that oftentimes a lot of the time is... Uh, <laughs> the time <laughs> for time. time. Three times, <laughs> 15 seconds. Uh, is in like the before you actually start rolling the dice for the first time. Time. <laughs> <laughs> right it's the setting up your stuff it's the double checking your crap it's the blah, 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 on the table <laughs> you know that'll take like 15 minutes sometimes maybe more um and it's just like the less shit you have the quicker that process goes but also if you're doing best of three typically after the first one those go quicker i guess we need to sideboarding bro okay so in magic they got a sideboard 15 card sideboard that after the first game that's how you can adapt your deck oh yeah you got 15, whatever you know, what like if a you little pool fucking, Sideboard, like you have a little pool, like, like your, your little hero dude. He's got a squire with him. He's like, oh shit, uh, get me the fire sword <laughs> <laughs> for the second game. You can swap out, yes, certain things. Yes, oh uh, man, I love this game already. Yeah, that's not a bad idea either. Um, okay, um, let's talk about board. Can we talk okay. about the game board? Sure. Yeah, this is something I don't really have figured out. Okay, I, I have a, I have a strong opinion on this. No, I don't say strong. But um, I'm just going to go out here and say so, this. Okay, is it about what I think it's about? Is it about measuring tapes versus... Yep. Okay. I'm curious what your opinion is because I I have an opinion. Fuck measuring tapes. Okay, yeah. It needs to be a grid. Fuck, fuck measuring tapes. It needs it's, to be a grid. Okay, for two main reasons. One is time. It takes so much more time to deal with always like, well, let me just check that there and let me check that there. And, and, and then you got to worry about... I don't want to say you got to worry about cheating, but like having things exact does not exist yes in the game we're talking about here as one th- important thing we didn't talk about earlier that nick brought up is it a cooperative game or is it a competitive that game? was a question i was going to ask and i think the answer for both of us is the same thing it's got to be competitive yeah it's got to be pvp yeah, war games yeah. right because this is about getting you out and meet new people going to events and all that <laughs> kind of stuff play a board game i know pv with people yeah, okay uh, Okay, there's conventions. Just be honest. Okay, we're aggressive. I want to murder another person. We're aggro people. Okay. With my fire sword. Okay? <laughs> That's what I'm here for. Okay? Now, I'm saying I'm not saying my my game wouldn't have an interesting campaign system where it was cooperative, where you could like join your forces together and go through this this part of it too to maybe learn the rules or develop your own campaigns to buildings stuff like that i'm just saying it's a possibility but the core of the game the game is around fighting other people yes you know and okay this people may be saying oh yeah well because uh warhammer underworlds does that well warhammer underworlds is a bad example of using a grid why is it, it a bad example it's a bad example for two reasons one the and they kind of all lead to the same thing um the boards are way too small okay you, you the amount of options you have is once you play that game a couple times i'm sure you know this now your actual options limited to movement are so restricted because of this because of the board it's too small and the grids are too big um i'm talking about like a one inch by one inch square grid D mat and roughly the size of uh war cry okay 
um, which is like a uh, 18, 18 by, by 18 or something like that. Something no, 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 like 26, three, it's, it's something three like by three, roughly three feet by three feet. So it's like the, the size of this black paper. It's a square. Table. Yeah, it's a square. Okay. Um, and I'm thinking like an inch and a half grid. So you can fit some little bit bigger sexy bases. But that also allows you to have heroes or things like that that take up a two by two. So Oh, there's an idea. Yeah, okay. So it's not just because that's one issue with with Underworlds. Everything has to fit on that same size. Yeah, thing. it's not that's, a bad idea. Actually. That's why they made them bigger. So this goes back to my years in playing Dungeons and & Dragons. And actually, there's a lot of things that you could take from the years of evolution and playtesting and redeveloping new additions from Dungeons and Dragons and grid uh, mapping like kind of the way combat works that you can beg, borrow and steal from because there's a lot of things that have been uh, evolved to do really, really well. And movement is a part of that. Um, how the grids work is a part of that. How um, you can actually do really cool things with the the board instead of it being just kind of, well, it's just kind of why we're here um, to make it much more engaging, more exciting um, on the actual battlefield. And there's enough space for which to work. Um, that's one of the par- the problems, especially when you're dealing with, if, if we go back to sci-fi or a lot of shooting and stuff, well, we can't be too far away. But we also can't be so close that either one of those really limits your design space and what kind of characters. So if I can be an awesome ass ice mage, but we start 10 squares away and the barbarian can charge me and murder me in the first round every time. So if he goes first, he just kind of gets in my face and I'm I'm so, so screwed. But there's a lot of balance in there, too. But just not having to measure shit. And knowing the amount of squares you move and knowing how you can you can more accurately make decisions on the fly because you can count stuff out and you, you it's so much easier. Plus, it's a lot easier to understand things like areas of effect, like spell effects, like all these different things, because it's still it's based on a grid system. It's not a okay. We saw this, I felt this a lot in Guild Ball, where a lot of the gotcha moments were based off of not only how far the guy could move, far they could move, what effect they could throw out, what's the AOE of that effect, and all these different variables that added up that are not visibly represented on the mat. Well, they're not going to be represented in our game either. They are not, but they're a lot more. Easier. They're easier for you to make mental decisions. Uh, right. On. Yeah. 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 That's just a general right. uh, truth for grids in general. Yes. You want them to be able yeah. to make cool, quick decisions. Yes. I totally agree. Um, so you're trying to keep those gotcha moments down, still strategies involved and, and catch people when you catch them. Yeah. But it's it's also I mean, to call a spade a spade here. They're never going to I'm saying never. Never is a strong word. You're never going to have a ten thousand dollar Warhammer 40K tournament. You're not. You're absolutely not. Do You want to know why you're not? Because when you put money like that on the line in a game that's so fucking fudgy on the most specific thing that you need for it to be competitive, and that is the exact measurements of things. Funny things start to happen. People get real angry. People get real the angry. Smallest things, and 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 suddenly that movement of nine inches is nine and a quarter now. Because you can't, yeah. you can't and call people matters. on that. That matters. It that. matters on a game where where you know four millimeters count, but yeah. when it squares, it's ones and zeros, babies. Yeah. We're taking away the arguments and the feels bads and the all that stuff. Yeah, which in general I think needs to happen in miniature war games. I agree. So let's talk about. So I agree with you. Grids are great. The one thing that's hard to deal with is verticality, mm-hmm. um, and also in my game it kind of seems like it's a gladiatorial style combat. And in those typical game like situations, there isn't like terrain. It's like here's a pit, fucking fight. Um, yeah, but, like arena rex. Yeah. So, but that. Kind of feels lame. I think some kind of terrain, some kind of line sight blocking thing would be cool. Like if you've ever played uh, Arena in World of Warcraft, mm-hmm. you have some that have like, you know, there's four main pillars you can block line sight with. There's even one that has like a bridge you go up on top of and can come down on. Some kind of terrain is cool. Um, but because it, it, it creates a, uh, an interesting story, an interesting action in the world. The yeah. Yeah. Movement, again, this it goes back to kind of my experience with Dungeons and Dragons. The, the most exciting fights, the most memorable fights, the most fun fights that you have in Dungeons and Dragons are where things are happening. Movements happening. Guys are running. A, you see this whole band of kobold that comes across the cliff face and they've got bows. OK, I got to figure out a way to get up that cliff face. and I got to run. I got to climb. and I got to, you know, rope swing. I got I got to do all these things to keep moving. Especially in your game, but I think it's true of all games. A lot of games are lazy about this. You need to be proactive in thinking about how movement and action is going to 
constantly be happening in the game. Yeah. And it needs to be worked into the, the the game system because otherwise your game can often be we meet in the middle and we do the things and we do la 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 one of us wins, right? So how do you reward movement? How do you allow movement that, that you can, you know, World of Warcraft, Ice Mage, Psh, AOE freeze around you and I can get away and you're stuck there for a round or something like that. Yeah, like yeah, all these cool yeah. things that can happen that want that. The Berserker wants to be on top of you and smashing you. Yeah. The, I don't want that and that, that ebb and flow in that. Um, I think why a skirmish game, you know, like I said, five to 15 minis, um, 15 is probably too much, but um, three to eight. Uh, three to ten. So uh, nah, you have these fun. other you have these other variables that allow more movement to be happening. That at any given time, just two people standing still and beating each, on each other does not slow the action because there's there's some other move. It's not so many variables in play and so many characters in play that makes it just overwhelming. But there's some repositioning and some like, yeah, you're going to sit there and you're going to try to beat on my paladin and try to smush him down. But I got some guys coming up behind you now because you just didn't move. And, and I got some archers that can take aim and they can climb up the tree. And like, there's some, some other aspects to keep things action oriented to movement. Yeah. But War Cry's added a bit of that to their game to add the third dimension to it. It feels a little bit tacked on. Um, the biggest reason that it, it works that way is because like, oh, you put objectives up on top of the bridge. So you're kind of forced to do it. Um, but I think there's a, there's not a game that I have played that really feels like it just makes it feel cooler, mm. um, that there's these interesting things there. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. And uh. there's map design too, right? Because we were talking about this. It's not just, well, we we go back and forth and both throw shit on the table. No, there are the, preset maps and yes. you pick from a pool of maps. Yes. Like every RTS in the world. Yeah, like, come maps. on guys. Oh man. That's when we, and when we launch season two, Bam! We new got maps. two new maps, baby. Yeah, and you can you can make your own map if you want to, but it's like this just makes the whole experience faster and like also more balanced because we can right. we can control that. And if you got a Rathy Basin map, um, A B Warsong Gulch, yeah, it, it's got these things. These are where are where are where are where and what what is there. But you could say. Oh, we're gonna do the Rathy Mason map, but I made my own map, and it's in the it's it's in the snow fields, and these are actually like big crags of rocks, and yeah. they take up the same dimensions. They have the they work the same rules wise, but they your Rathy Basin could look way lit different than my Rathy Basin. So there's another hobby aspect to it yeah. that makes it really cool. The one problem with the 75 mil scale is terrain. Is if you wanted to make terrain, it would need to be 75 mil scale terrain. <laughs> But, okay, I didn't really explain why I wanted to use that scale. As far as I know, there is no game that uses this scale. Uh, right? Didn't, uh, what's that one we played at Adepticon a couple years back? So that one was, that one was 54 millimeter. Okay. Um, I can't even remember what it's called. It's so, that one to me seemed like it was trying to be WoW Arena in a board game. Mm -hmm. Which on paper sounds fucking amazing. Mm -hmm. Um, I'd also play that game, 100%. Um, the other thing is, if you're playing a game and you have one dude in the army, uh, I feel like it should be big and fancy. And like, if it should it, be uh, like playing the action figures, <laughs> kind of, yeah. Um, and so, if it's bigger and cooler, you only have one to paint. And so, you know, it's bigger and more fun. Um, also, we talked about list building and shit. I was like, what if you had like different weapons you could give the character? You could buy like an upgrade pack. Oh, yeah. So, like, if my ranger here has got a knife, I could, you know, get an upgrade pack that give him access to different weapons. Um, and you could represent that on the model by assembling it in a different way. Um, and that'd be cool. Yeah. So, you got like three different builds. You got your sword and shield paladin. Yeah. You got your, your flaming two handed sword paladin. Yes. You got your flaming two handed sword. Uh, yeah. You got your holy water sprinkler paladin. Yeah. And you've, you've, <laughs> You've either built them different, or you've kit bashed them, yes. or like because I think kit bashing absolutely it allow customization. It's like I actually have three different models for my three different paladins based on which build I'm doing. Yeah, he looks different. Yeah. I think that is and kit bashing also is harder in this scale. Yeah, because you're dealing with resin. No one's got probably. no one's got bits that fucking scale. You know, right? Yeah, yeah, you got that kind of thing. But I think the customization of of the models is an aspect of the game that excites a lot of people, myself included. Absolutely. And to have them look like the cool decisions you made in in how you set up the character or the warband is visibly there. You don't have to. 
Um, this goes to a question, kind of uh, revolves to a question that Nick was talking about. Would this, is this a miniatures agnostic game? Is our ideal game a miniatures agnostic game, or is no. it a game that has its own minis for it? I love games with their own minis. I want your minis. I want minis. I also want to be able to beg, borrow, and steal parts from other games to make it and make mine more cool or whatever, but I want the minis. You know what? There is nothing wrong with miniature agnostic games, and I'm not just saying this because Vince made one. Um I, uh, since getting into A Song of Ice and Fire, I've explored other games. One is Oathmark uh, by the guys that make Frostgrave. Their company's called, help me out, Stained Osprey Panda. Osprey Games. Osprey. It's not Stained Panda? It's not Stained Panda, but that's the name of our company. Yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's, uh, just, it's just a <laughs> racing streak down the forehead of a panda. <laughs> <laughs> Stained Panda. Um so, okay, why I bring that up though, Oathmark, because I would love to play Oathmark, and it's a mini agnostic game. It, I think there are some generic dudes, but I would love to go out and find a bunch of cool STLs, print them out, use GW figures, whatever, and make an army. But mm. I fucking love minis. I love designing miniatures, so of course I'd want to design awesome models for, for the game. Mm. But you could use any model you wanted. I, I wouldn't mind if someone did that. Yeah, well, let's talk about this from a. Uh, with the back to the businessy side. Okay, of okay, course. Let's talk businessy here. Yeah, okay. you want to make money making your own models. No, that's that's not it. That's a nice side effect of this. But um, different people are attracted to your game for different reasons. And there's a large segment of people that will first be exposed to or first start an interest in or think about learning more about it based on the models. Yeah. If you do not have those, you are taking a large segment of your potential audience and you are just saying, goodbye. Yes, goodbye, but you sweet are prince. also opening a can of worms, right? Yeah. With rules, you can distribute that digitally. Yeah. Right, with minis, bro. Dude, we ain't here for a fly-by-night kind of thing. No. We're here to talk about... To talk about <laughs> 2027 Stained Panda games. <laughs> Um, and I, I, I mean, you just get more hype. You get more people excited. They want, they see the mods. Oh, that's so super cool. Oh, I can like have them build them all these different ways and all oh, like, and then they try your game and they get excited about it. Or there's that other group that's like, oh, the rule set looks cool. The artwork looks super cool. Oh, it does have minis as well. Oh, I see a painted up box art. That looks amazing. Like, you know, people don't get into Warhammer because they see a book on the bookshelf and they're like, I want to read this whole book and play this game. No, they see people's awesome ass models. Yes. That's why they want to learn it. Yes. That's it. So I want that and I want them to look cool. I, w- I want them to be high quality. I want them to feel like they exist in the same world. Yeah. I want to yeah, control that process. I want all that lore. Yes. <laughs> <sighs> yeah, it needs to, it needs to feel like it is it, it, there's something about like it, it has more of a weight to it right it's like it's, this game's gonna be around this game like right. other people are gonna play this game so right these are great and all this stuff is like you know hey, did you guys hear about that did you guys see that it's on the shelf in the store and it's like you, you get people to do the thing you want them to do and that's to sit down and play a game right you know and so i think that i think models baby very important we're all about models okay Let's okay see. we had to kind of start wrapping up but what are other elements of your game or a game that you've thought about and you think are important? Because I have some as well. I had a, a really important one and I, I when we were talking about the grid and I lost it. So you go. I'll see if I can find it. Okay. I think that randomization should be removed from the game in a significant way. Mm. And not like... Okay. I love how Song and Guild Ball had the system set up. So it's like when things should probably happen they happen Mm -hmm. so you know how okay in the game with dice like the reason the dice exists mostly is to create like epic moments tension Mm -hmm. i still want those moments to exist those like one in 20 chances one in 10 chances whatever but when i invest in a situation that should happen it should fucking happen sure nine out of ten times sure because we're talking about gameplay experience right nothing is fucking worse then doing everything right strategically and getting boned by shitty dice four to ten times. Like, that's not okay. Yeah. So I would want to create a system that works around, works with dice, but doesn't make it the gameplay experience terrible. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's that's one thing. I I com- 
I, I'm uh, in theory, I'm on board with you. I yeah. think that there is a balance there, and yes. I think oftentimes games lean too much into the randomization. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, and and it's weird too. And, and I keep going back to Warhammer, but in games like that, how stats are considered better or worse is how much they remove the standard the randomization. It's really interesting if you think about it that way. Think about um, oh. rend. Think about armor penetration. Right. You think it's about, guaranteed. You think about high damage weapons. Okay? Yes. All of that is about consistency. That's yeah. all that those things are because there's still random dice rolls at the end of the day. But with rend, that means I make your armor lower, meaning I have more chance to do consistent things. Yes. And if I, I still think dice rolling should be a part of the game. I, I think agree. It should it, it, some of the most exciting moments come from the dice rolling but it should have a a base floor line of things where it's like yeah. it's, i i know to a level that if you rush in at me you can't like you roll all sixes i just die right away okay i can right. do a reaction and freeze you and i take half damage after i see how much damage you did right but like there's some reliable things yeah it's worth thinking about the fact that magic the gathering has no dice in it yeah. right it is quantifiable well, there, it uses randomization in a different way. Right, with a deck. You're with right. Deck. You're right. You're right. I forgot about that. Um, um, okay, so that's my first thing. But I the, have more things. But the cards do the thing they're going to do. I, I had one. It was really important, and I can't remember it. But maybe I'm just giving away the whole the whole cow milk. Milk and cow. I'm giving away the milk, <laughs> but I still have the cow, and you guys need cottage cheese. So go. <laughs> um, I think there should be... Some way, okay. The stats of the models, the balance of the game needs to be digital, right? Yes. You need to be able to patch the game quarterly, whatever, bi monthly, um, not too often that you fucking ruin the game, but you need to have a way to release the rules to people. And that's the way they read most of the rules and update those rules. So this has to be like digital or something like that, right? Yeah. Um, because you want, you want to balance the game, right? Yeah. I, I to me a logical way of dealing with this is having a a, a paid app, one time right. pay. Like it costs you five dollars for the app. Yeah, and then you get all the rules for the game, and you get all the updates naturally what happens through the app. So we're you don't have to worry about having to buy stuff because I already I'm already invested in your game. All those things are patched. All those things are refined for me. So we're always on the same page of how things work. Yeah, and everyone gets the rules from the same spot. Yeah, and, and, and I one. have I have a user login on my thing, and I say I'm playing a game with Scott. Scott, I can find you on there. Bloop. Now it shows both of our stats at the same time. And as and I'm doing play, damage. And what boom. are you saying right now? Yeah. Are you, are you saying what I think you're saying right now? Because that's the next thing I want to say. What's that? Fucking rating MMR, yeah. bro. Oh. When you play a game and you log your game in your app and you log the results, your rating should go up and down. And no there should be a rating. There should be a ladder. Oh. A global and a regional ladder. Yeah. Okay. And there's different waypoint systems work. It's all based on the app. If you go to an event and that event is logged and those points are based on yeah, official but, events. But the app process has it built into yes. it. So if you're doing your drafting and your gameplay in the app, then the rating collection is also in the app. Yep. And you can skip it too. If you're playing a casual game, like whatever. I don't care about that. But I I fucking love ladders, dude. Yeah, dude. And because <laughs> it, it the the MMR works because it can it can be all algorithms on the back side of like I'm rank hundred in the world, you're rank hundred and fifty million. <laughs> you wank. You're wank hundred and fifty million. I if I beat you i'm gonna get a really fuck load of mmr yeah you you are but if i beat you i'm not farming mmr right exactly you know, like it, to a level like the overall thing like whatever i like okay one of the things that i like was seasons guild ball did seasons yeah it allows you to do these things where cool events can happen there's a great way to you know excite the community and introduce new little tweaks that maybe don't last forever your game is your game but in this season there's this interesting thing or this thing on the map or it's a new map and it goes a different way yeah, like they have like rookies or something like that yeah or, or there's um you know this season takes place in the realm of death there's these cool different items and upgrades and stuff that you have access to for this season yeah you got to have things that keep keep the the fire alive yeah and keep it tweaked enough to it still is your game and why they enjoy your game is because your game is good but these different things, like uh, Path of Exile is a great example, too. Is like they do this different thing in a season, and it's so much fun to play that, but it's still the core game, but there's this extra thing. And then next season, it's different. So it still feels fresh, even though, at the end of the day, it's the core game that makes it good. Yeah. Um, I, I can't think of mine. I had a really 
really good one. It was the best one of all the ones. And uh, I think that's it. I um, I fear the the MMR thing is the straw that broke the camel's back in terms of it being too much like a video game. And I think when, when we say that out loud to the goody peepees, most of them are going to not be super interested in that. Mm-hmm. So I think that's the one detail I'm worried about with the game that I like to make, that it'd be too similar to a video game. It would require an app too much of the time. It's like, I don't want a fucking phone right now. I want to play this game and not worry about the phone. Cause I realize that including a phone means that you're looking at your phone, you see notifications, you're not talking to your opponent as much. So yeah, I'm still, I'm still concerned about that. Yeah. I think one thing that having a, a an app that, that kind of goes with you as you're playing the game is we're talking about time as, as well. Like it will take some of the time stuff away from, from you physically having to do things. Yeah. Because it's like, okay, well, I hit you with the Berserker Axe and now your health's down to 42. I don't have to like do this and do this and do this and all these kinds of things that it still needs to very much feel like a tangible, unique tabletop experience. That is an aid that keeps us in the fun. It's not a distraction. I know. I, I agree. I, I'm just thinking like, you know, like theoretically in its best version, how it, how it acts. Yeah. There's, there's a, there's a way to play a game in there that's like free play that we don't worry about MMR. We don't worry about like every time I play a game, I have to be playing super hard mode. We can play a ranked game if we were like, oh, we're doing a, a get together every Wednesday night at my local club and we're going to play ranked games if for people that want. People want to play free games. So you, you don't have to. We like don't have to push the, you know, the competitive side on it too much. The fact that it's there, though, is an option for a lot of people, even if whether or not they even involve themselves in it feels like it's got more weight and substance and and willingness to kind of get yourself in um invested in the game because know that it's it's there and it's supported mm. um so that's it i can't i can't think of my other my other big one but that's, right. that's okay well before before uh stained panda games comes out with it i'm sure i'll have it all figured out but that that's it like we basically went through and made a game right now instead of like our favorite game what we would like in a favorite game we just invented it right well i think there's a huge thing that we didn't talk about too much and that's the specifics of the gameplay it's like what does that look like like i said for honor but in a miniature war game but how does that translate to dice rolling and like what you can do like you know, in D and D, they're like, you know, you can like, you can run and you can walk and you can like, you can walk quietly. So it's like, how does that translate to an actual physical rule set? That is the hardest part um, to do that we haven't done yet. Yeah, I I think that that gets into really the the nitty gritty of game design. That's not something we want to do a podcast on as as logistics because that is like, okay, we're actually invested in making a thing. We're putting pen to paper and fleshing out mechanics right yeah which honestly i've never done and have no idea what that mm-hmm. process looks like but i can tell you that um i've done a bit of that of my own versions of dungeons and dragons but nice i can tell you that if you don't do this part first and have a clear vision and excitement and, and drive behind it guiding force of what we what we want to do at some point you'll fall too far away from it and it'll end up being something you're like, this doesn't feel like what I wanted it to be mm. because you, you have to have your core, you know, like, like, like Iron Man, you know, he needs to have the fake heart <laughs> and you can't get too far from the fake heart or he dies. Arc you know, reactor. That's arc it. Reactor, is that arc, what it's called? Sure. That thing. That's just Marvel it. nerds. Am I right? The arc <laughs> reactor. All right. <laughs> All right. Anyways. Goody peepees. What, what is an aspect of your ideal game? That you're like, if a game did this, this excites me the most. What what a part of what we talked about <laughs> sounded like garbage or excited you the most? Because we're gonna take these things <laughs> and, and profit off and of them, steal them <laughs> to make our own game. I, t- I keep on saying we're making our own game. I feel like kind of I've spoken it into the universe, and so now it has to happen. Well, there are many things that you and I want to do. Yeah, there are. We want to host conventions. Yeah. We want to make games. We want to make miniatures. We yeah. want to, you know. You've heard of PAX? It's just called Goody Peepees Con. Goody Peepees. Tendy Con. Goes all over the world. Not if I fucking have any if have any involvement in making a con, it is not going to be called fucking Tendy Con. <laughs> Okay, dude, that, that could be the name everyone calls it. Whatever, it's a fun name, but not on paper. <laughs> well, I mean, TendyCon Malaysia is gonna be a house, bro. <laughs> I mean, Malaysia. <laughs> I'm saying we're going everywhere. <laughs> All right, 
Uh, Sydney, fine. Okay, Tennycon, Sydney. I would do Sydney. I would do Sydney. Not Tennycon, though. <laughs> uh, oh, by the way, I thought of a name for a painting competition. We, I, I couldn't think of one for the longest time, but I think we should call ours or mine or whatever mm. uh, the Gauntlet. Mm. And the award should be like a fucking, fucking armored steel. fist. <laughs> you uh, got fisted. <laughs> yeah, 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 you got fisted. Dude. If you win the golden gauntlet, you get fi- you got fisted. You got fisted. <laughs> <laughs> hey Ben, you been fisted yet? But no yeah. man, it's only my first year. I haven't been fisted. <laughs> but yeah, dude, you gotta run the gauntlet, dude. Isn't that sick? Oh, you gotta run the gauntlet. That's the competition. You gotta I run got it. it. And then you got fucking awesome. Uh, you just ruined it. But then whatever. <laughs> I'm calling it that. I don't fucking care. Okay. All right. Okay. Out of the news, <laughs> St. Louis restaurant has attendee bouquet for Valentine's Day. Good, good friend of the show, Heath, uh, Heath of Hobby Time in the Murder Basement, Heath. reached out to me. Do you do that still? Uh, yeah, yeah. And he just started a new podcast. Pog called uh, Something Wholesome. That's the name of the podcast. Nice. And it's with another content creator. Um, and, and so I started listening to the first. Uh, what? Who is who I, is I can't other. remember his name. I'm sorry. Okay. I can't remember. Um That's all right. It's just blanking on me. I know who he is. I watched his stream. Um but yeah, it's just about life, and, life and all sorts of things. Is no. it Reiner? Nope. Nope. Um and I, and I just uh it, it seems cool. So yeah, check out something wholesome. I uh so he sent me this. He's like, "Hey man, a local restaurant is doing a a tendy bouquet." For Valentine's Day. So I clicked on it. And it just takes me to the restaurant <laughs> website. And it's just their menu. And you can order your tendy bouquet in advance. So uh, you make sure you get one for your holiday honey. <laughs> Tell them you love them. With some spicy nugs. <laughs> <laughs> that is news. That's all we got to talk about. That's uh, all I got to say. No, no. 40K bathrobes? All right. So y'all may hate me for this. But I was looking through spiky bits the other day. <laughs> And uh, I just kind of like holy ran, shit, they're expensive. Them. Yeah, you want a fifty dollars bathrobe? And like you thought, if you thought that like Games Workshop, you've gone too far. You make scented candles with forty k themes. They're like, hold my beer. We're gonna make bathrobes that look like ridiculous forty k costumes. If you thought candles was extreme, this is. If somebody you love comes out of the bathroom wearing one of these. Like, kneecap them and run for your life. <laughs> your life will be better for it. Is this really that bad? I kind of like this more than candles, honestly. Yeah, I, I do too. Like, I wouldn't wear no, that God. particularly myself. But I could see if I was really into 40K. Like, Space Marine Steve, I'm playing tabletop. He's totally getting the ultramarine <laughs> robe. I want pictures, Steve. I want pictures of you in the 40K. Uh, ultramarine rope. Dude, this website is fucking shit, bro. <laughs> There's a lower third ad and a banner ad, and I've already exited out of two different ads, and there are ads that play on the fucking website. Literally, there's like five different sources of advertisement on Spiky Bits website. Holy shit, dude. Take a chill pill, guys. Uh, hey, I hear you like malware. Um, <laughs> it's not <laughs> malware. <laughs> I don't know. It's fucking like, visual where's the, malware. Where's the line, right? right. Like, there, there's a line somewhere. It's like, nah, 17 continuous ads. That's not past the line. But that's not that far removed from, well, what's the Russian Federation going to give me <laughs> to put some shit on your computer? I don't know. I don't know. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not making any. I'm kind not of saying thing. it, but I'm saying it. <laughs> I don't uh, yeah, too many ads, Spiky Bits. I will go on record saying that. Um, Okay, uh, LVO is going on right now. Right now. This weekend. Uh, I know that because I was supposed to play someone who was prepping for the A Song of Ice and Fire LVO tournament yesterday at my weekly A Song of Ice and Fire hangout. There was two guys going, and one was going to play Curse, one was going to play me. Okay. Uh, okay. And they didn't fucking show up. What? So I had a curb stomp a noob. I'm sorry, noob. Uh, how did that feel? Uh, you know, the luster of winning easily, it definitely wears off fast. Mm. Most of the people that go to it are, uh, um, newer players. Mm-hmm. There aren't many experienced people, um, which is fine. Like I get to teach them the game. We talk about after the game is done we say like, okay, and like, these are things you can work on. Like, uh, he had an issue with his list building. There wasn't a lot of synergy there. Uh, he didn't play many tactics cards, so we could have this discussion, but, you know. I think it's good. I think if you keep that positive, um, I think that's, you know, going back to the game. Um, 
the greatest game ever. There's an issue with with a lot of times with um, I didn't see it as much or hardly at all in Guild Ball, but I see it a lot in Age of Sigmar, and that is the mistakes that you made are a lot harder to learn from oftentimes because they're so in the moment they're they're not really apparent. Yes. And you, they can pass you by. So the learning curve to understand how you can get better, when the, by the time the game's over, you you just don't absorb those things because the actual outcome of why that placing these guys here instead of three quarters of an inch back here, yeah, doesn't show itself as being a fatal mistake until like two rounds later or whatever, right? right. And so it's really hard to draw a direct line between. Something you did, a decision you made, and what that affected, and sometimes it's it's a trickle down, and it can be very difficult. So that's that's going to be inherent in any game. It's part of the learning curve. You want a game to be have depth and to have a, a you know a level of skill involved that you learn from, but it can be very hard in certain games. Yeah. Um, one thing I didn't know about LVO was the biggest Song of Ice and Fire tournament in America is that LVO. America. Yes. Uh, if you don't know what LVO is, it's Las Vegas Open. It's one of the cons that happens annually in America, in Las Vegas, no less. Mostly a gaming tournament, but there is some hobby stuff there. Yeah, I guess they have a painting competition there. Yeah. I didn't know that. I would say if Adepticon is 50-50, LVO is probably more like 80-20, gaming versus hobby. painting or hobby. Uh, I don't, yeah, I wouldn't say necessarily like painting competition, but like the hobby side of it. Oh, yeah. It's, no, it's there like a, competition. There it's like a big... It, like it's a big 40k yeah and it's getting bigger every year yeah. i think uh andy wardle is going really yeah really yeah and so i think whatever maybe he's teaching some classes maybe that's why uh or maybe he's competing maybe he's doing both he's not teaching at adepticon strange yeah so i was listening to their uh what is it called Paint cult, cult of painters, culture of paint, culture podcast. of paint. The podcast. As we're listening to their more recent episode, some interesting things were brought up there, Andrew. Um, and uh, one of the things that surprised me was they were talking about people that were coming, and I was shocked to hear some of the names based on the fact that those people aren't teaching. Because I, I could, I could tell. Because I, well, the first thing I signed up for Adepticon is like, let me see who's teaching. See who's coming to the big show for Golden Demon, right? You see the Ben Comets, Comets of the world. You see Matt Sex Wishes of the world. You know, you see your Chris Suries and your whatever the amazing, uh, the many amazing American painters on that list. But I didn't see as many European painters, and I'm like, oh gosh, maybe they're not coming. You know, maybe Sergio's not coming. Maybe. You know, all these Europeans. I didn't see Richard Gray on there. I didn't see Andy Wardle on there. Um, so I was like, oh, David Soper. I'm like, so I guess they're not coming. But then Andy's on there, you know, talking about they're coming. And I'm like, really? Golden Demon's important, bro. It's more important than than teaching there, I guess. Well, maybe he didn't get offered. I don't the whole the whole being able to teach classes at Depth and Con, you kinda gotta know somebody, you know. I don't know. I don't yeah, it feels like some of the best painters <sighs> in the world that are coming aren't gonna be teaching there. And also maybe, maybe they there's teach. Maybe there yeah, that there's maybe that, but there's also perhaps the um the uncertainty level of if they could come. Like I could oh, see, sure. you know, like Andy and Richard being like we don't know exactly what it's going to be like. I don't want to commit to it. I don't want to put my name down to being a teacher. And then state of the world, I, I just can't come. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. and so put you guys in a bad spot. So I get that. Maybe that's that it probably is some part of the factor as well. So it's right. I think he is. I think he did mention he's going to LVO. There's a bunch of streamers and other people I know that are going to LVO. Nice. Uh, good old Duffers. Uh, <laughs> impending Duff get, at, offered me a spot in the room last second. And he's like, 90 bucks, bro. I got a cheaper room. I got a space free. And I'm like, man, we're already planning to go get our puppy this weekend. Oh, yeah, I don't know yeah, if yeah. I would be able to do it anyway, but I was, I was like, oh, man, I just itchy. <sighs> I don't even know what I'd do there. i just like walk around. I would definitely play in the Song of Ice and Fire tournament. Yeah. I would go with my boo-boo Zuela. Zuzu Buela. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like Boo Boo Zuela. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. When you come to Tendicon Malaysia, you at the door as part of your 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 uh you know your price of entry, you get a Boo Boo Zuela. <laughs> Most annoying con <laughs> in the world. All right, last thing. Levado made another video. John, who's Levado? Levado. Um, Levado. it's a it's a city in Texas. Yeah. Uh, no, that's Laredo. 
Mm. Um, Levedo is the gentleman who made the video of uh, all the mini painters in the MCU universe yes. when uh, the Henry Cavill and Squidmar is calling for all the painters to come. Yeah. And then we all show up. Yeah, okay, yeah, he yeah. made another video based off of our recent uh, episode of Trapped Under Plastic. We were talking about uh, Golden Demon. We'll put a link to that video in the description below of us. You and I, as what were we, Imperial Knights? Yes, or Chaos Knights, uh, possibly Knight Titans. I, we were, we, yeah, we were Chaos Knight t- Titans. Whatever. Oh, okay, Renegade we, Knights. Renegade Knights. Yeah, That's absolutely. the term, and it's like this Galadriel voice. It's from like Dawn of War two or something. It's one of the intro it's videos. Dawn of War three, uh, like gameplay trailer. Okay, I believe. Okay, and so there's this Wraith Knight, which is the Eldar. Night. I think yeah. I know what the name of that thing is. I hope that's right. And and the I'll head the head is the golden demon, and it's like this Galadriel voice of they don't. We know that death is not the end of blah 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 blah. And then we come running in. It's fucking renegade knights. And then Scott gets fucking sawed in half by the Ray Knight sword. And I fucking chain sword her right through the chesticles. And then she falls over. And then Laredo has himself as a little chaos space marine. And he's standing under her and she's falling on top of him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the greatest video I've ever seen in my life. Yeah, yeah. I definitely understand why you would like that narrative more than being Pepper Potts. (laughs) So uh, personally, I prefer being Spider-Man than being a sawn in half a fucking renegade knight. Dude, but, you, you know, gave, you, you got it right once. You right gave now. her a good pot shot from the behind. That, yeah. like, poof, and then she turned around and was like, oh, shit. And then you just ran right into that sword. <laughs> I don't know what you were thinking. Uh, I mean, I appreciate it. I appreciate all the tracking work you have to do for that. Uh, Levedo. I called him Laredo because of the fucking Texas city. Uh, <laughs> we thank you. Thank you. Welcome to the end of the podcast. Thank you for hanging out. I wanted to say one thing before we get into our regular rigmarole of saying a bunch of bullshit and then chilling. Um, <laughs> we mentioned the sign earlier made by Jonathan Waretka, which is filled out with sprues from you and from me and John. And a lot of those boxes uh, came with really nice notes in them and also some gifts. What? Um, I, did. didn't know, I didn't know any of this. Yeah, they did. Um, and I want to read those letters, at least in part, on an episode of the podcast. And I'd like to do that when we have the sign and we're in the new space. Oh, good call. That's That'd be a professional. Fun, yeah. And they're actually in that black bag right there. There are some stickers and pins for you as well. Some people oh. sent two of each and one for both of us. Um, so, yes, uh, I did not forget about you. Your contribution was definitely meaningful to me uh, and to John at some point in the future, probably, <laughs> when he reads them. Um, and we'll, we will read them on, uh, on on an episode, so don't don't worry about that. But uh, let's chill. Uh, if you like this podcast, how do people support this podcast, John? First and foremost, if you consider yourself a goody PP, the first thing you do is you go down to the DMV and you change your driver's license to goody PP. G-O-O-D-Y-P-P. That's seven letters. You can put it on, on a license plate. That's the first thing you do. Second thing you do is you pop while you're in the parking lot at the DMV before you've even left there. You pop up uh, Trapped Under Plastic uh, website and you buy a goody PP shirt. Boom. Now you're double goody PPs. The third thing you do doesn't cost you any money at all is you join the Facebook group. We got uh, over 12,000 people on the Facebook what group. What the fuck? <laughs> uh, and talk about everything from tennis to miniature painting, get some responses, get to learn that about other crazy. great things. Like, uh, honestly, weird. For me, it has become not just because I think this pe- goody peepees are funny and they say funny stuff. They do that, but it's actually like the place of finding news, finding interesting things, finding interesting paint jobs, all that kind of stuff is like matriculated to the trapped under plastic Facebook group. It is a place for knowledge and wisdom. Let's uh, take a brief moment here to Google the word matriculated. What the fuck does that mean? I'll continue to shill while you look at matriculate. Be enrolled at college or university, uh, or the Scottish heraldry version is an official register. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> what other ways 
Uh, so other free ways is you can whitelist this channel on YouTube. So it plays ads. We play two ads, three ads, 72 an ad every 30 minutes. We so. fucking go spiky bits on this bitch. Yeah, dude. <laughs> fucking top, bottom, side, left, fucking the rear everywhere. We're in the, all the orifices. The only thing that you can actually see on the YouTube version of the show is just the whites of our eyes. Everything <laughs> else is ads. Yeah, dude. Fucking ads on ads. We're fucking exhibit in this bitch. <laughs> <laughs> oh, pimp my ride. Okay, <laughs> so we uh, uh, so you can whitelist it, so it plays some ads, and then we get a, a couple of shickles a month for that. Um, you can also tell your nerd friends about the podcast, so we can grow the Goody PP Nation. Right, that nation needs to annex from whatever nation you currently reside in, and we'll buy an island with our Bezos bucks. Yeah, and we will become the Goody PP Nation. No taxes. All others will be shot. Yeah, no taxes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. You can help with that by telling other nerds about us. Think of it as a nice cult. Think of it as a pyramid scheme. Yeah. So we'll, you just knock on your neighbor's doors and you said, <laughs> have, have you heard about tendies? Wear a white shirt and a black tie and black pants. Yes. Uh -huh. I think you will get better reception wearing that specific outfit. Yes. A hundred percent. Yeah. Um, so there's that. You could do that. You could do that. Uh, you could join us on the Trapped Under Plastic Patreon, which... For five dollar redos a month, you get access to the after party, which is the extended version of the podcast. You get the video and audio versions of the regular podcast, plus the after party is lumped in as well. So it's a one full experience for all your orifices. In that version, you get about approximately 30, 20, 30 minutes of more things. What do we talk about in the after party, Scott? We give feedback to one of the goody peepees in the episode. So as a patron, you can submit a model for us to give feedback to in an episode. Also, as a patron, you can submit topics for us to discuss. This month was, sorry, this week was a podcast topic from one of the people. From Nick. 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 I forgot his last name, but I remember there was a pronunciation guide in it. Uh, you Is also Nick Epeen. <laughs> you also get access uh, that, Sorry, the extended portion of the podcast is also us talking about new things we tried out and have learned from and failed with. And lastly, we talk about models that we have seen from other painters that we have liked in the last two weeks. Yeah. So it is well worth dipping into your due budget mm. for $5 dues a month to join us there. And that allows us to also support the podcast to buy shit. Once we get over to the new studio, you'll see what your dollar dues have purchased because yes, we've been buying shit. We, we got some set stuff that's going to rock your world for sure. It's a lot of pressure. Yeah. We got to rock everyone's world. I know. It's mostly your pressure because I haven't been there yet to know exactly how much world rocking we we're got talking walls. about. walls. <laughs> They're cool. Yeah. And eventually your dollar reduce will go towards us making a terrible game, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> all right. That's all for now. We'll catch you on the flippity flip.